Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Oh Shoot. I'm your host, Cassidy Lynn, and thank you guys so much for listening to today's episode and for being here. Welcome to the new year. A new year means new episodes, and I have some really fun interviews that I'm doing this year for the podcast. And honestly, we are still pumping out episodes every single week. So if you guys are an avid listener. Thank you so much. And we're going to keep doing that for the rest of 2023. So I'm excited for all the different topics we're going to cover. Today's topic is photography advice. I basically just posted something on my Instagram story. And um, yeah, I just asked you guys if you had anything that you needed advice on. So I have a few of those different questions and scenarios that you guys need help on and we are going to talk about it. So I'm very excited. Before we jump into it, um, I haven't really given life updates in a while, so we are going to do that. So I feel like there's just a lot that I haven't talked about, not necessarily bad things, but just like things. So the first thing that I wanted to mention, and I think it's like going to be valuable to everybody listening to is that I got a walking pad. And if you don't know what a walking pad is, it's basically like a treadmill, but like without the like top part of it, it's literally just like the pad that like rotates. Um, And I got that for underneath my desk so that I can walk and work. And so far I have really loved it. And I feel like this is going to be valuable for everyone listening that like does photography from home or like is just like self-employed because the walking pad is life-changing. I have always felt like I want to exercise, but like genuinely do not have time in my day because I just have so much work to do. So yeah, I got a walking pad. With that being said though, I kind of had this like, (laughs) it was a bad situation that happened with my walking pad at the very start, like right when I got it. I was so excited to set it up that I like set up my camera and was like recording a video because I was like, oh, I'm going to post this on TikTok. And literally I set it up and when I start using it, it like was crooked. And so the whole belt like started to fray and like tear apart as I was like trying to figure out how to stop this walking pad because it like it's very hard to understand. And so like I was trying to figure out how to get it shut off. It kept fraying and it was just going over and over again. All that to say, I, the walking pad is fine now. Basically what we had to do is Charlie had to like run a knife on the little track and had to cut the side that was frayed. And so it's like not as big of a tread area as before, but it's fine. It's only a couple inches we had to cut off. And I recorded that and I ended up posting it on TikTok and just being like, you'll never believe what happened to my walking pad. And I ended up getting like 2 million views on that video, which, you know, when you post something and you just like feel it and you're like, oh, I feel like this is going to go viral. That's how I felt when I posted it. I was like, I just have a feeling that this is going to get a lot of views. And it did. But because of that, I feel like a lot of people like, you know, criticize you and whatever. So that was a very interesting experience. But All of that being said, I did get a walking pad. I do love it. And if you have thought about getting a walking pad or if you like going on walks during the summer, the walking pad is so nice for winter. I literally like put it underneath my desk and worked for, I think it was like two hours. And I walked so far. It was like three miles or something like that. And I was like, that's three miles that I would have never been able to do without this walking pad. And I really just feel like, that's kind of my vibe. It's just like multitasking. Like I want to exercise, but I feel like the time that it takes to exercise is a lot of the times why I don't like get to the gym as often as I want to. So I'm hoping that this walking pad can kind of be like that little bit of motivation for me. The second thing, um, is I've been having like a few of my videos on TikTok have been getting more views than I'm used to. So like I had my walking pad video get like 2 million views. I posted this other video, um, like literally just like a 15 second reply to someone's comment. And that got like over a million views. 
and like a few of my other videos have gotten recently in like the 300,000 range for views, which on TikTok is kind of rare for me. For Instagram, like I find that I do get like usually more views than TikTok. Um, but for some reason, I feel like TikTok and Instagram, my views have just been higher. I don't know if that's because of like the new year and people wanting to learn more about photography. My account's like more interesting. I don't know. Um, so if you guys like going in and studying videos and like seeing how videos perform and stuff, now is a really fun time on TikTok and Instagram to kind of just like post some videos, see how they perform. I've been finding that the videos that I don't spend a ton of time on are always the videos that go viral. So the videos that I'm just like very low key about, you know, spent like literally two minutes making are always the videos that get the most views. So yeah, that's just something that I thought is very interesting. Okay. I think that's all I have for life updates. Um, yeah. Uh, let's just get it, get right into it, I guess. So like I said, I posted Instagram stories and you guys submitted some things that you need advice on. I tried to pick like a wide range of topics and I tried to pick topics that were different from my last advice column that I did. I think it was like, it's at this point it had to have been a couple months ago, but, um, yeah, I just try, I try to like switch it up a little bit. So I'm not giving the same advice on like all the same things. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say is you guys have been loving last week's episode that I did with Taylor Sumner. So thank you guys so much for all the positive feedback on that episode. It was such a great episode. She's an amazing photographer and amazing human. So, um, yeah, I just want to say thank you guys so much for loving that episode and letting me know that you loved it. Like I love that. Okay. Here is the first submission. Hi, Cassidy. So recently I shot an engagement session for a client who is a model and would be considered an Instagram influencer. My session with her went great and she gave me a positive response to the sneak peeks. The day after the shoe, I decided to, po I decided to post the photos on Instagram and got a really positive response. It was amazing until the client sent me a text asking me to take the post down because she wanted to review all the photos before I share anything online. I, of course, was hesitant because she hadn't communicated any of this beforehand and I didn't want to take away the amazing response and exposure I was getting on my work. She responded by stating that she assumed it was common courtesy to ask before posting and that she expected a level of professionalism because she paid for the shoot. She also stated that she wanted to share the photos with her own audience first. This was a huge dilemma for me because it felt like this was my work and I wanted to share share it how I felt best for my business. I nevertheless took the post down in fear that she would retaliate on my business through her Instagram following. Some advice on when and how to go about posting client photos would be appreciated. Things to note, she signed a contract giving her consent for photos to be shared, agreeing that all rights to the photos belong to the photographer. Okay, so first of all, I want to say that this is such a tricky situation. I've been in a situation similar-ish to this. I haven't like had a thing with like someone with a gigantic following, but I do feel like that the following part of it does impact the situation a little bit. Um, I think it does impact like how she reacted to the photos being posted. So I do understand that it's exciting to have sneak peeks and to post them. And yes, you do have every right to post them because she signed a contract. However, <laughs> just because someone signs a contract doesn't mean that they fully understand the contract. So like, I don't necessarily think that like you need to go all legal on her, but like maybe just bring it up to her that like you do respect that she wants to review all the photos, but like the work is yours and she signed the contract. Therefore you're allowed to post any photos that you want. The only catch with this, that specific, like if you were to go that route is like you said, she could re retaliate and kind of like give your business a bad name. So you're kind of in a sticky situation because it's like, well, you don't want her to trash your business name, but you want to stand up for your business. So what I would do is honestly what you did, which is take the post down, wait for all the photos to be done and then be like, Hey, just want to let you know, like 
now that I delivered all the photos to you, I'm going to be posting photos from your session. Um, like it was great working with you, loved capturing you in your element, whatever, like, thanks again for choosing me to be your photographer. Just kind of keep it there and just like, let her know, like, I will be posting these photos. I also do understand the desire for the person that you photographed them wanting to share the photos first. Um, it's hard because like, you're so excited about the photos and you want to share them, but like there are certain situations where, you know, the client wants to share the photos first or at least not be tagged in them. And it sounds like you are getting a lot of positive feedback because, you know, this is an Instagram influencer and they have a big following and you probably tagged them. So because of that, I do think that like maybe not posting before the client, like just running it by them to make sure it's okay. I know like with proposals and engagements, that's usually always the case is like the couple wants to post first before anyone else. It just kind of depends on how chill your client is. Like there are some people that are so chill about it. They don't care at all. There are other people that are a little bit more uptight about it and care a little bit more. So in this case, it sounds like the influencer cared more. Um, and I mean, they, they do have a right to, you know, maybe not want you to share the photos before them, but you also do have a right to share the photos eventually. So don't get down on yourself. Know that when you repost those photos, you're probably going to get that same positive response again. It might not be like exactly what it was before, but you're still going to have at least a little bit of a positive response. Um, and you can only learn from here. So, um, that would be my advice. And again, I'm sorry that this is something that you're dealing with. It's always awkward when like both sides, like the photographer and the client, you know, both have rights and like, you know, I see both sides. So it's, it can be tricky. So let's jump to this next one. Pricing help. I want to raise my prices, like double them. I sell landscape prints in addition to shooting families and engagements. And right now I sell a lot and have been told by my customers that I am underpricing myself, but I'm selling both landscape prints and I've met many family photo clients at a weekly artisan market right now. And I'm worried that people won't spend much more on a photograph or a session with a photographer they randomly found at this market. Like, where I'm selling maybe has a price cap. Do I just try it and then reduce prices? If I don't sell anything, I feel like reducing prices is a terrible thing to do, but maybe that's just my personal view and it doesn't really matter. So you have a very good point about having a price cap at this market. Unless you are like creating some sort of personal connection with these people that are shopping for prints at this market, like unless there's like something that is communicating your value beyond just like, here are my photos. I do think that you might run into a scenario where you are price capped as far as like the market goes, because these random people that are coming up to you and coming up to your booth or whatever, they don't know your value. Like they don't know why your photographs are special unless you are able to somehow communicate that at the market you know, whether that's through, um, I don't know, like a, a little story that you can tell, maybe like a little bio about you. I know a lot of times when I see art, the art that I'm attracted to and connected to is never the art that I just look at. And like, that's it. It's always like when I go and read the story behind it and read about the artist. So something like that might be able to give you a little bit of value. So then you can up your prices. I think because you do have people that are customers and they're telling you to bump up your prices, that's a pretty good indication that you probably should bump your prices up. Um, the thing that I always tell people is like, no one's going to know when you bump your prices up unless they're a recurring customer. So no one's going to know when you bump them up. No one's going to know when you reduce them. So you saying like, I feel like reducing my prices is a terrible thing to do. I personally think that if you're not selling at a price point, reduce your prices. No one's going to know that you reduced them unless it's like someone that has checked your prices in the past or like someone that has worked with you before, but a client that's new and like someone that's coming up to your booth at this market that's new, isn't going to know that your prices are lower than they were before or higher than they were before. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. Like don't overthink it. Like prices are so fluid. You can change your prices all the time. 
So don't feel like your prices are like set in stone and you like have to follow them like all the time. Like it's not like your prices are set forever and ever and ever. Like you can change your prices if you need to. Okay. Let's go to the next one. This person says, I started my business in October of last year and had a very successful holiday season, thankfully. But because I was so new and doing so many sessions, they did 23 in total. I was still very much an amateur and still learning how to get consistent edits and learning everything else. With the new year starting, I'm determined to get my editing style down and figure out the direction I want to take my business. What is your advice for a newbie that is fighting discouragement and feeling like I need to have everything figured out? Also advice on presets that I like or recommend. Okay, so if you're feeling discouraged and you're a newbie, um, I think the biggest thing, and you might not realize that you're doing this, is comparing yourself to other photographers who are way more established than you. You cannot compare yourself to someone that is in a completely different state in their business. Like they're at just like a completely different point. You know, they've had longer to develop or whatever. Um, if you feel like you need to have everything figured out, just know that you don't like there are certain things that need to be figured out. Okay. So like, for example, you need a camera, you need a lens, you need an editing software. Honestly, if we are being like for real, that, that is like all that you actually need. Like you don't need much more than that. So start with the basics and go from there. Like eventually make a website. It doesn't have to be like your, the website that you're going to have for like the rest of your life. Like there are things that you cannot figure out right away. And you just kind of have to accept that and just be content with the fact that like you're killing it right now. And like, there are going to be things you have to improve in the future, but you don't have to do them all at once. If you're a beginner, you have to think in terms of like step by step. You can't think of like everything you have to do as a whole. Otherwise you are literally going to shrivel up with stress. Okay. So take things one step out of a, at a time. It's good to recognize that, that there are things you need to do. Like that's a great thing skill to have, like to be able to know what needs to be done. That's going to help you in the future for sure. But like, you don't have to have everything figured out. Okay. Let's talk about your second question, which is advice on presets that I like or recommend. So if you are listening and you don't know, I have my own presets that I sell my matcha glow preset pack, my honey boba preset pack. I love both of those dearly. I currently edit with my matcha glow preset pack. As far as other presets go. I'm not 100% like familiar with tons of other presets because I really use my own or create them. I would recommend finding someone that you think is credible and someone that you follow, maybe someone that you like trust in the photography industry and you really like their edits. If they do sell their presets, start there. Or I would also recommend learning the tone curve, learning how to make your own preset. So then when you do go and get someone else's preset, you're able to tweak it to get the things that you need like tweaked. So it's important to understand editing and presets, but you do need a consistent base preset to help you get all of your work looking the exact same. So that's going to be the one thing, the one piece of advice that I would have is no matter what, find a preset and stick with it. It might take you, you know, a month to find a preset, but like you need to get that preset set in stone because people need to know what they can expect from you when they hire you. Okay. So this next person says, I just started up my photography business back in September of 2022. I want to get a website up and going. I feel like I have enough work, couples and families mainly, to display on the website. However, I want to advertise weddings. I'm struggling because I don't have any photos to show for, for weddings. I have two weddings booked October 2023 and March of 2024. I'm also doing bridal portraits for my friend in a couple of months. Part of me says not to include weddings on the website, but then how will people know I'm open to shooting weddings? Any advice? So this is a really tricky place to be in. And um, I just want to let you know and like validate how you're feeling because it's actually very difficult to transition from something that you're 
used to shooting to something that you have no nothing to show for, but yet you want to shoot it. So that is a very tricky situation that you're in. I would say you need to show what you want to shoot. Um, you need to have it as an option. So if you don't have any wedding content right now, which it sounds like you don't, show couples and then somehow you need to get at least one bridal session. So that can either be finding a style shoot or content day near you. You can pay for a ticket or create your own content day. Find your own couple, ask people to model and wear their wedding attire. You would be so surprised at the people that are willing to put on their wedding attire again and get free photos. Like that's how I got a lot of my portfolio at the beginning of my career was just asking people to model for me. And that's something you could do tomorrow. And you'll have that stuff up on your website by the end of the week. Um, There's no sense in waiting until the end of next year to start advertising for weddings. Create that content right now. And this goes for any niche. Doesn't just have to be weddings. If you want to get into a specific area of photography, don't wait for the perfect opportunity to come to you. The only way you're going to build your portfolio is by chasing it yourself. It's not, I feel like people are very rarely just going to come to you and be like, oh, you look like you could shoot a wedding. Do you want to? People do that, but like, I feel like it's rare and like people are more likely to book a photographer who they see can do it. So get that stuff in your portfolio and definitely offer it on your website. People who are looking for a wedding photographer specifically want to know that you shoot weddings and like that is your main focus because weddings are so particular and they're like a whole obstacle of their own. So people, clients, they like to see that you have experience in that and that's what you're specialized in. I hope that answered your question. Best of luck. (laughs) Okay. So this next person says, should I get a CPA? Right now I use QuickBooks and send all of my income expenses and miles reports to my tax accountant at tax time. I've been working, it's been working well, but do you have any recommendations? So if you don't know what a CPA is, I'll try to explain it because I don't really know 100% what it is either. A CPA is basically like, it's not someone that like does your taxes for you. It's someone that like, sees all the money that flows in and out and like tells you how to reduce your expenses and um, just kind of like gives you advice on like how to make better money decisions or how to save more money, whatever. Personally, I do not have a CPA. I just have my accountant who I send over my reports and everything to and they file my taxes for me. Um, I, I don't, I don't necessarily think that you need it. I, I had a, like a couple months ago, I had this moment where I was like, I really need a CPA, you know, like this is something I need to do. I need to find one. And I went around asking for a CPA. I was trying to find literally anyone and anyone that I found was either ridiculously expensive, like $12,000 a year. Like, and I was like, (laughs) I was just thinking to myself, like, are they actually going to help me save the amount that I'm paying them. Like, I just, I don't know. I felt very weird about it. It didn't really feel like that was an investment that I needed to be making right now. Um, so I think just kind of use your judgment, but if it's working for you, I would say if it works, like don't fix what's not broken. Um, if you need someone that can like sit down with you and talk over your stuff, like maybe quarterly or something, maybe try to find a CPA for that. Um, but I, I know like within QuickBooks, you can literally just go and like look at their reports and just kind of analyze stuff on your own. So I don't necessarily think that a CPA is necessary for you at this moment, but it could be helpful. I'm also like not an expert on this or a financial advisor. So don't like hate me if that's like not the answer that you wanted. (laughs) Okay. So This next person says, I just started photography six months ago and recently got into weddings. I can't help but feel extremely anxious and nervous before weddings and feel like I might not totally be ready. Is this feeling normal or is it a sign that weddings aren't for me? 
I just hear so often about people jumping into weddings and loving it. But for me, I feel sick to my stomach and I have a hard time saying no. My clients are usually looking for a more affordable photographer anyway. So maybe it's a good match since I'm just beginning. Okay. So yes, it is very normal to get nervous before a wedding. I get nervous before every single wedding in case you needed to hear that. I get nervous before my shoots. I get nervous before weddings. I get nervous before podcast interviews. I get nervous before I record videos. Like I, I'm a nervous person. Okay. So I totally get where you're coming from. Weddings specifically are very nerve wracking. Like there's just a lot that rides on a wedding, you know, like you are, you have a very big responsibility. And I honestly think it's a good thing if you're nervous before a wedding, because that shows that you care about your job and you actually find your job to be important and you know how valuable and important your role is on a wedding day. I think that's a very normal and healthy thing to feel. I I think your comment about like you being more affordable and like it being a good match since you're just beginning. I, I think that you shouldn't undervalue yourself though. Like it does sound like you maybe aren't super confident in this being, you know, in wedding photography being your thing, which is totally fine. Um, but I, I think you just need a little bit of confidence in your work and in yourself. Like just be confident in like the fact that you can capture a wedding day. You're good at it. Um, and you know, the people that are hiring you, you know, care about your photos. Like, I think those are the things you need to be confident in. And I just want to say, like, I think it's good that you are doing something that's outside of your comfort zone. Cause right now it sounds like weddings are not your comfort zone, which is totally okay. Like, I think you really grow and thrive when you're not constantly in your comfort zone. That's how I am. Like I'm the type of person that would stay in my comfort zone all day, every day. But I know if I do that, I'm not going to grow and things are going to stay stagnant. And I can't stand the thought of things staying stagnant. Like I, I want to see growth. So I think it's good. Like what you're feeling right now is good and keep at it. If in a year from now, you're like, man, I am just like, I cannot handle weddings. It's too much for me then maybe like reevaluate things, but it's normal to get nervous. I would say focus on the feeling after a wedding or during a wedding instead of right before, like that's going to indicate whether or not it's meant for you or not. Does that make sense? I I'm hoping that that's kind of registering for you. Okay. The next person says I'm getting my photography business started I've shared on my socials about offering professional photos if anyone wants a session, but I've only gotten one session and that was three months ago. I don't know how to get more sessions going. Also, how does a beginner price, how does a beginner price their work? I don't think I can charge too much since I'm starting out, but I don't want to charge a little either. So the first part of this, which is how do you get more sessions going? I think you need to do a lot more at the beginning of your photography business than you ever do ever. Like when you are starting your business, you need to be putting in the work and the hours. So don't just post about it on socials, like go out and connect with other photographers, go to vendor meetups, like meet up with other photographers, maybe reach out to people on Instagram, see if they want to model for you. Like You need to do more than just like posts on socials. You need to put your name out there in tons of different ways. You need to start an email list. You need to post on your personal Facebook page. You need to join Facebook groups. You need to text people. Like there's just so much more that goes into it right at the beginning. So I would say put more work into it and you're going to get more work out of it. I promise you. Ask people to model for you. Like there, there are so many things that you could do that I think you might not be doing right now that are going to help you grow that business. Um, and then as far as pricing works, I would say just like price, what price yourself, what you feel comfortable charging. Um, you know, maybe look around locally to see if there are photographers at a similar, similar place as you, you know, people who are beginners or like maybe people that are like a little bit more established, see what they charge and then just charge like lower than what they charge. Um, 
price yourself at what it would be worth for you to go and shoot a session. If it's worth $50 for you, charge $50. If you're like, eh, I'm feeling more like 150, great, charge 150. Like you should be getting paid for your work. But I do think there are times where you need to do a few free shoots as well. So just kind of like use your judgment there. Um, but you got this. I just want you to know, like the person that wrote this, like it sounds like you really want it to happen, but like just put that work in and you're going to see results. I promise. Hi, I'm a photographer in a mid-sized city. Most of my work and referrals come from two local people. I love being their go-to person for my specialty. I'm very niched, but I like to di- I'd like to diversify in the new year, so I'm not dependent on just those two individuals for work. Any advice on branching out and developing new relationships? So, how you're feeling right now about not wanting to be dependent on two people for business is 100% a valid feeling because that's not a very smart way to run your business. Cause if they stop referring you, like they stop referring you and then you stop getting business. So your question, I feel like, so you said any advice on branching out and developing new relationships. I feel like the answer is in your question. You need to branch out and develop new relationships. You need to reach out to other photographers. You need to reach out to other people who can model for you. Cause it, you said you're very niche. You didn't say what your niche is but reach out to those people that you feel like fit that niche and like get yourself in other circles of people or start working on other means of marketing like social media. That's a great mean of marketing and it's free. Instagram, TikTok, Pinterest, start with those. I can guarantee you will start getting bookings from like those channels instead of relying so much on other people. Word of mouth is a great way to get bookings, but I don't think it's a like something that you 100% have to rely on if you don't want to. So you're relying on these two people right now. Diversify your marketing streams and figure out other ways that you can get your name out there. Um, there are so many other ways, but that that's what I would recommend. Marketing and then like creating community, finding other photographers, finding just like people in your friend group or just other people that you can connect with, that's going to help you with just getting your name out there and kind of diversifying those inquiries, you know, how people hear about you. How do you deal with unsupportive friends and family? I have friends and family that expect a discount from me when I first started photography and only found out through other people. And they ended up going to other photographers because I didn't give a discount. How would you deal with situations like this? Um, At the end of the day, you want people to value your work. And if you end up working with these friends or family members that don't value your work, number one, it's going to affect your confidence. You're not going to feel as confident in your work because you're giving it away for like way less than what you normally would. But two, when you work for family and friends, you know, your hope is that they refer you to their friends and it's, it kind of starts like a word of mouth thing. But if you are charging less than what you normally would, they are going to like only bring in inquiries that are like around the same price range as they expect. Does that make sense? Like, by you giving them a discount, it's also putting an expectation on all the people that they influence to also get a discount. Um, so I think it's tricky. I personally do give friends and family discounts, but it's gotta be like, you've gotta be like present in my life and I've gotta like see you regularly. Like, so for me, it's like immediate family. Like I have a few groups of family friends that I give discounts to. And then like, I have just a very small group of, I have just a small group of extended family too that I would give a discount to. But beyond that, like just be upfront with people if they don't value that, like you don't need their business anyway. If it's someone that is like very close to you in your inner circle and your immediate family, um, maybe ask yourself, why are you not giving them a discount? And if you have valid reasons, then explain that to them. Um, You know, I I think it's a very sticky situation. I don't necessarily think that there are right or wrong answers, but I do know that like when you do shoot family and friends, 
there's a lot of added pressure and it can be really hard mentally as well. So keep that in mind and like, don't undervalue yourself. If you think that mentally you cannot handle it, like shooting a family friend or like just someone that's close to you can't handle it, then like, don't do it. This next person asked, is it okay to start a small business with a lower quality DSLR camera? I don't have the money for an upgrade right now. Should that hold me back? If I eventually upgrade, what's the best camera? Is mirrorless the jump I should make? Sony, Canon, or Nikon? Thank you. (laughs) So let's start with your first question. Is it okay to start a small business with a lower quality DSLR camera? Oh, yes. 1,000%. I don't think anyone's going to (laughs) notice. To be honest, like... I don't think anyone's going to be like, your sensor isn't as big as this person's sensor. Like, I'm not going to work with you. I don't think people think like that. I I really truly think they're looking just at the final end results of the, the shoots you've done. Like in your portfolio, they're looking, yes, a little bit at quality, but mostly for like lighting, location, edit, like things like that. So definitely start your business with a lower quality DSLR. I did it. A lot of people have done it. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. You can still take great photos. I think that's like the message that I want to get across at the end of the day is like you can still take great photos no matter the quality of the camera. There are like some things like I probably wouldn't recommend a point and shoot camera like for client work. But if you have a DSLR, like just use it. If that's what you can afford, like come on, like just do it. Like you're good to go. So no, it shouldn't hold you back to answer that question. And, um, your next question is if you eventually upgrade, what is the best camera to upgrade to? So if you're listening to this, you already know how I feel. I love mirrorless. I think the sooner you can switch to mirrorless, the better, because that's where like the market is headed and the less headache it is later on. So If you're shooting on, let's say, a Canon Rebel right now, um, I would recommend, if you can, switch to a full-frame mirrorless camera. Or if you can't get full-frame, get crop sensor. Nikon, the... I think it's the D... (laughs) The D... Oh, I can't remember what it's called. The Nikon something. It's like a Nikon... I have to look this up. This is really going to bother me. Um, also the, there are great Sony cameras that you can start with as well that are mirrorless. A great camera to start off with for Sony is the Sony a6000. That's a great mirrorless camera. That's going to be a little bit more affordable, um, for Nikon. Um, I actually don't, I don't know of any Nikon starters, maybe like the Z6 or something like that. Um, That would be a great camera to start with. The Sony a7 III is a great mirrorless camera to start with. Right now, I don't feel like Canon has great mirrorless cameras for beginners, like the beginner price range. All of Canon's mirrorless cameras are relatively expensive. So um, that would be my recommendation for cameras to start with. If you do, for some reason, end up sticking with DSLR, I would recommend um, the Canon 5D Mark... Oh, no, 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 not 5D. The Canon 6D Mark II is a good camera. You don't necessarily need, like, this amazing camera to start a photography business. You can take photos on anything. That's basically the point that I want to get across. Like, you can do anything with a decent camera, okay? So, like, don't get down on yourself if you don't have, like, the newest and best gear out there. Um, yeah. And I tried to name some good options for you. Um, so this next person says when people, you know, in your life are starting to get engaged and married, how do you gracefully shoot your shot with being their photographer and how can you pitch yourself without them feeling weird about it? uh, Weird about saying no, or just straight up ghosting you. So This is a very weird situation and I've had people pitch themselves to me and I'm just like, I'm sorry, like I'm just not interested and that's awkward. So I would say like 
bring it up once and just like mention like, hey, if you need a wedding photographer, let me know. I'd love to shoot your wedding. Leave it at that. There are, (laughs) there have been people that like, I don't know, like just bring it up constantly. And I feel like that can be almost like detrimental to your relationship and harmful to your relationship because it leaves like that little bit of an awkward air um, if they say no or if they ghost you. So um, just kind of leave it up to them or just straight up ask them like, hey, have you found a photographer? What are you thinking for photography? Like I'm available, but don't feel pressured. Like would love to work with you, but like no pressure. I think adding in that no pressure thing is good because like then they feel okay being like, oh, we found someone else or whatever. Photography is so like when you're looking for a wedding photographer, it's it's so personal preference. Like people look for edits like they look for style and like personality and like they're just looking for different things. Everyone looks for a different thing in a wedding photographer. So like some people might really value like this style or this style and your style might just not be their style. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily put them in that awkward situation, but just like bring it up once, let them know, like, even if they don't hire you, like you can help them or whatever, just like be open and there for them. Don't just like cold call someone and be like, Hey, I want to shoot your wedding. Like, I feel like that never goes over well. Most people already have an idea in their head of like what they are expecting and what they want. Okay, how do you keep track of specifics about a couple personally, such as info they share during a consultation, like their dog's names or a movie they both quote a lot, things that wouldn't be on an intake form but are key connection points to show them you care? This is a really great question. And the fact that you're even asking this (laughs) shows that you care. This is something that I thought about too. I'm like, How do you remember if you have 20, 30 clients a year, how do you remember what makes everyone different? So what I do is I use the notes option in HoneyBook. And while I'm on a phone call with someone, I am just typing away all the different things I need to know. You know, I'm writing down names, I'm writing down movies or, um, you know, just different things. Like if they mention that they're from this area or whatever, like I'm just jotting random things down. And then before a session, I'll go into the notes and like review that before I go shoot a wedding or a session or whatever. Um, So just literally just take notes about it. I would say that's like my best piece of advice because it is important to connect with someone. And the only way you're going to remember probably is by reviewing it right before. Um, It's not cheating. It's like a good way to remember things like I I think just like a psychology thing is literally like write things down. Like when you think like, oh, I'll remember that later. I don't have to write that down. That's when you should write something down because you're probably not going to remember it. So like, don't sweat it, write it down and then like review it later. You know, why make, why make life harder for you? Okay. My, this is my last submission. How do you keep up content posting on Instagram when you are just starting out in photography and only booking a few sessions a month? I would like to post more consistently, but don't know what to post. So if you are in this boat where you don't feel like you have enough content, my recommendation would be to go out and make content. If you feel like you have just completely overposted all of your sessions, you know, go out and create the content that you want to be posting. Another like little trick though, is with every session offer two locations and two outfits. So then you are getting variety from every single shoot. So for example, then if you are doing, you said like four to five sessions a month, let's say you do five sessions a month, you have two outfits and two locations for each session. That's actually 10 sessions a month because you are creating variety in the session enough that you're able to then post a second location and it doesn't necessarily look exactly like it's the same session. So you already have 10 posts right there. A month is 30 days long. What is that? Like three posts a month base or not a month, three posts a week. Like that's pretty good. Like, I don't think you need any more than that. So I would say like use the content that you're getting. If you really truly feel like you don't have enough content, go out and create that content for yourself. I do that all the time. I schedule shoots for myself. I go out and 
create shoots and I just do stuff for fun because I'm like, you know what? My feed is looking a little boring. Let's spice it up a little bit. You can also reach back into your archives. So a couple months back and pull something from there. Don't be afraid to reuse content. Also, don't feel like you need to post three times a week. Maybe you just post twice a week or once a week. Like, don't feel like you need to have this like insane posting schedule. Okay. That's not the vibe anymore. Like the vibe on Instagram right now is quality posts over quantity of posts. So create those quality posts, whether that's reusing content you already have or recreating stuff, like kind of re-editing things. You can go out and create your own content. You know, the options are endless. So yeah, that would be my advice for that. Okay, guys, that's it for today's episode. Thank you so much for listening. I am so glad that you made it this far in the episode. If you liked today's episode, I would love for you to rate and review the podcast. And don't forget that my podcasts are on YouTube. So if you like to put a face with my voice, you can head over to YouTube, which is linked in the description and you'll be able to watch the podcasts every week. All right, guys, thanks for listening and have a great rest of your day.